we are live and rocking here. <laughs> Good morning, all you wonderful ladies. And to our listeners, we are happy that you're joining us today. This is hosted by the woman I love. My name is Becky Norwood. Um, we are all, everybody here has participated in our We Choose to Thrive, our voices rising in unison to share with to share with abuse survivors a message of open inspiration for healing. Each one have shared a chapter in the book of their story, their amazing stories. And before I introduce them, I want to set the tone by reading a couple of quotes that I feel will kind of set the tone for why we are here today and what this means to us. So the first quote is by Marianne Williamson. And it asks the question, who am I to be brilliant? And who am I to be gorgeous? And it says, we're all meant to shine. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we consciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And that's our hope for today. And the other quote that I want to make is one of mine. It certainly takes more courage and strength to walk away from a bad situation than to stay in it. Staying is familiar. No matter how bad it is, it's kind of what you know. You know what you're up against. While, step, while walking away is stepping into the unknown in uncharted waters. So it does take courage. So today I want to introduce to you our our co-authors in the book, and we have Kaylin Ribbins. She and I have been doing some cool stuff together. We have some big projects coming up. She's a woman's life coach, speaker, and author in the making. She's the creator of the Gift of You Blueprint, where she believes each woman is, a, is her greatest gift and greatest adventure. Her and I are working together on a million women message tour which is pretty exciting and we'll be sharing with you as we move forward. Terry Lanahan is a survivor of childhood domestic abuse, childhood sexual abuse, sibling abuse, domestic violence. She's a published and award-winning poet. Pretty amazing and she's in the process of writing a book to tell her, her using her poetry to tell her story. She's a volunteer advocate at the Domestic Abuse and Sexual Assault Center in Butte, Montana. And she's volunteered there on and off for over 20 years. Welcome, Terry. Thanks. Heather Heather Egan is from Canada. It, um, where is it? Edmonton? Uh, Ontario. Ontario. Um, she's been nearly 30 years on her healing journey, um, overcoming the challenges of being sexually abused when she was a teenager. Now she's helping assist other women who've had abuse in their lives. And she does it through a lot of creativity and using art as one of her, her, her art forms. Um, she says that she's living a very joyous life now and feels empowered with the accomplishments that she has made. Welcome, Heather. Christina is married. She's going on 27 years now to a man who has had to endure many challenges. She has two beautiful daughters, and she is going to be a grandma soon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's excited to share her, her chapter along with all the rest of us, and um, she says, no longer do I give power to abuse by keeping it locked in the secret. The power is in all of us as we not only survive, but we thrive. Very cool. Okay, and now we have um, Sandra. And Sandra is one of our newest, she was one of the, very, one of the light, latest chapters in the book, and she, we just met just recently through a mutual friend. Sandra Joyce is an entre, entrepreneur extraordinaire. Like that. She's had her own business since she's 1980, with a range, which ranged from owning a therapeutic spa to investing and selling real estate, speaking internationally on health and healing, to creating a leading ex, leading. Ex, experiential workshops for women as she who remembers the female success blueprint and glowing rich mastermind courses. Welcome Sandra. Karen Tyson is an MB, M, MPA grad, candidate and graduate research assistant at Auburn University focusing on nonprofit management with specializing in sexual violence prevention and women's reproductive health. Her research has included topics such as U.S. rape statutes, policy analysis of Georgia's rape 
in the first statute, Human Trafficking and Planned Parenthood Recruiting Strategies. Welcome, Karen. And Renee, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Renee Jean. I have been an author for most of my life, though published since 2014. I live in Las Vegas. I work day shift as a casino dealer. Gives me a lot of chance to a lot. And I'm just really excited to be a part of this panel. Very cool. Thank you. So let's get started with our questions for today and the sharing. And I'm sorry for the extra noise. I don't know where it's coming from, but we'll just we'll just make the best of it. Okay, so our first question, and I'll start with you, Karen. What prompted you to share your story with We Choose to Thrive? Um, I became a, a member of the RAIN Speakers Bureau and got the email and thought it was a wonderful project to uh, be a part of. Um, anything to help and spread the message that people aren't alone and that there's life after this sort of sexual violence is really important to me. And I also have a six-year-old daughter. And so one day she will really understand the gravity of this. And I want her to know, you know, look at mommy. Mommy went and got her master's degree. Mommy's gotten awards. Mommy's did this. And she's okay. There's, there is life after this. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Um, Sandra, what prompted you to share your story with us? Well, I get goosebumps even thinking about it, but uh, for 19 years, I wanted to share my story, and I didn't feel I could. I was afraid of some retaliation and also some pushback from court hearings, et cetera, legal proceedings. And so I said that when my son turned 19, I was going to tell my story. And what happened is he turned 19 just recently, and it was in the one-week time frame that I had to write my chapter that I connected with Becky. And so on his birthday, I pushed the send button with my story, and it was just such an, an amazing experience for me. I didn't even realize it right at the moment. And then later I went, oh, my God, I said I would do this. <laughs> I put it into the world that I would do this. I said I would, and I did without, you know, it was an unconscious, conscious choice. And so um, it just has been very liberating uh, personally, and hopefully it will help other women who have some similar story to me. Thank you, Sandra. How about you, Heather? Well, the universe keeps uh, having the platform bigger and bigger for me. I've been telling my story for years and uh, it's been with friends and uh, with partners that I've had and and uh, just lately especially last year like I was putting myself out on my business page on Facebook and then as well as on YouTube and when your friend Sue uh, referred me to you uh, it was like okay this is going <laughs> to be huge this platform is even bigger because and to be encompassed by uh, so many empowering women that you uh, co-authored have their stories in, in the book that uh, that's really what it's about is is to join and amongst other women rather than being on your own and getting the message out to show that um, yes there is life after uh, your experience you don't have to stay where you are and uh, we are shining examples to that Thank you. That's beautiful. Terry? Hi. Um, my secrets were killing me. Um, I just got to a point where I had to start talking about it. I had been suicidal throughout my life, cutting my wrists and taking overdoses and stuff. And I just realized that I needed to start telling my story. And um, it started with just a few close friends I would tell. Um, Social media became a great outlet for me to be able to share my poetry and tell my story through my poetry. So that's been really amazing in my life to have that outlet. So, Thank yeah. you. And I so relate with that. For me, depression was such a, ugh. it was, it was like just a heavy blanket, wet blanket that gets put over your mind. And it's so hard to even breathe, let alone enjoy life, you know? Yes. 
and, into, and then speaking up, sharing the story, doing what we're doing right now has just totally liberated me. It has. And, and that's yep. what I want to share with everyone, too. You know, all of us, that's our message. This is liberating. Yep. How about you, Christina? Well, I actually met you several years ago, and never would I have imagined that it would come to this. And we both had stories at that time, but neither one of us shared with one another what was going on with us. And um, I think right now um, it just ended up that I read your story because we're Facebook friends, and I read your story and bought it, and and I shared with you my story, and you asked me to share. So that's how it came to now. So. Thank you. And that was, it was funny because I held the lingerie party in your home. <laughs> yeah. I had a lingerie business at one time, and I used to go to people's homes and do lingerie parties. So that's where that happened. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Renee. You got to turn yeah. up here. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, actually, similar to you and Christina, a friend of mine who's a fellow indie author, she was in an online chat room and I just kind of stumbled upon it. She said, hey, you know, we do a lot of charity writing. I was thinking of maybe doing an anthology about fighting back, fighting back against different kinds of violence. The subject of domestic violence came up. And I said, actually, I've been toying with the idea of writing my own book because I actually went through something when I was a teenager. And she said, oh, my God, so did I. We started chatting back and forth. And then, you know, you know that I released my book a couple years ago. Um, and she released hers, too, at the same time. We did a big online and live event together to try to raise awareness on the subject. And it was therapeutic, to say the least. Yeah, very much therapeutic, yes. And I know in, in my local area, there's about five of us that are in the book, and we're going to be doing a live event to, as well locally. So it's going to be very cool. So I encourage if there are anybody living close to each other, you can um, tap into each other. And our Kaylin, tell us you, what you're, why are you sharing your story? You know, mine, <clears throat> it's interesting because when I, you, you and I, we, we talk on a, twice a week basis and it's been such a huge blessing in my life and as you and I were talking I had completely because I'd gone through a, a deep forgiveness process and and had I'd forgotten that this had actually happened it had been it had been when I was you know a little girl um but still I was able to I have been able to get through that and I realized that it's still part of who I am and, and being able to really thrive in such a way that, you know, if, if, if we can do it, so many other women can thrive. We can overcome these things. We can do something better with our lives. We can be, be more. And, uh, you know, as you and I were talking, I realized, yeah, I, this did happen. But I, I was able, I have been able, because of going through some very deep forgiveness processes and striving to become better in my life, that I wanted to just be the very best I could be, and that's part of my story that has allowed me the opportunity to be able to move forward. I find that the more we, we share and the more that we, we work on the forgiveness and all of that, the, the less power it holds over us. Wow. And, and, and that's what is so amazing. And, and, I'm so thankful for because when it loses its power over you, life just changes dramatically. Oh, you know? it, it opens up. Like, yes. like really, there's infinite possibilities everywhere you look because that no longer is there. You have taken back. You own your power. And you're saying, no, I've got a life to live, and I'm going to be rocking awesome at it. So here I go. <laughs> you know? Very cool. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'll start this next question with you, Kaylin. In your own process of healing, what was your greatest obstacle? Oh, wow. Confronting my abuser. That was, it was really, really hard. And I had the huge blessing of being able, at that time of my life, having a dear friend and colleague who had experienced similar things with her daughters. 
And she's like, you, we can do this. And it was, it had just debilitated me. I was having a difficult time in my marriage. I was having a hard time with intimacy. It was really, really painful. And I couldn't get it swirling out of my head to go away. And the biggest obstacle was when she said, this is what's going to happen. He may not apologize, but you need to forgive him forgive you and move on. And, and it took a lot of buildup. It took, <laughs> she touched me for a while on that part. <laughs> it, was, it was definitely an extended period of time. But, but when I did, I was just like, oh, I'm shaking so bad. And as I, as I went into his, where he was at, because I, there's no need for me to talk to him. You know, why should I? Um, it was really challenging to hear him just kind of like blow it off. Like, well, you know, that's what happened back in the day. And I'm like, I don't think so. I don't think that's just what happened back in the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to accept that, that she was there with me. I had my friend with me. Empowering. And being able to do that. And when I left, I was still shaking, but I was calm. Yeah, and, and release. And, and, and I'm not going to say that, you know, it was just miraculous, but it just, as it came through, it was just like, I just had this settling of peace finally start to roll over me. And it just, it felt good. You know, and after being able to, to get through that part, I was then able to address the, the, the challenges that I was feeling um, with intimacy and things in our marriage. And, and, I was just so grateful that I had the strength of a friend who was like, I, I, you need this. You've got to be able to move forward because I know what it's like to be held back. She was your angel. Oh, earthly angel. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Renee, what was your um, greatest obstacle in healing? Well, being that I now live on the other side of the country, I never actually spoke to my abuser. Um, don't know that I ever actually will again. But for me, the hardest thing was not only telling my mom, but realizing that for so many years, she had no idea what I had gone through and that I had kept it from the most important person in my life. She was my best friend. And because of that, I'd been so afraid to let her know. She found out by reading the book. I asked her to beta read the book. And wow. she got on a plane and flew out to Las Vegas from Michigan to come and spend time with me. So Beautiful. looking at her face and saying, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you was probably the hardest thing I've done. But she said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. How beautiful. Thank goodness for mom. Yes. <laughs> Heather? I think the hardest part for me has been reclaiming my feminine sexuality. Uh, my abuse started when I was 13. Um, it happened with a friend's uh, father and you know when you're 13 you're already feeling awkward about your things Bridging. changing within yourself right and uh, so it was like okay and then for the next 10 years uh, shortly after that it, it began with my uncle and uh, I finally was able to you know um, find uh, my voice to tell my mom and then it was just you know step after step with that but the the even to say sexual was such a oh my that sounds like a dirty word you know but that's our that's our birthright and and everything falls into that your self-worth your your um self-hatred um unforgiveness all of that the shame. and yes shame was a huge cloak that, that I wore and uh, so I and to family you know um, it, it uh, the, my family it, it ended up being a betrayal uh, not really siding with me and I've done that whole thing where well I'm important so you know either he stopped showing up at family events or I am and I had to because they they chose not to uh, feel uncomfortable. They they just wanted to go with the flow and not you know create a mm -hmm. fuss kind of thing. So uh, yeah, it's just it's it's uh, it's honestly it's been a blessing to 
um, uncover what my true self is instead of keeping it covered up and hiding. I know in my family I asked my aunt one time why my grandparents didn't step in. They just stayed away. And she said they didn't want to rock the boat. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I'm finding I am a boat rocker, so, you know. <laughs> Most of us are. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If you're going to stand out and, and be an example, then, yes, you do shake the, the chicken's hen and, and uh, the chicken's um, little hen house. And, <laughs> and so that's something that I've had to accept in myself as well. Thank you. Um, Terry. Hi. Hi. Um, Breaking through the isolation and the shame was the hardest things that I had to do. And even today, even though I've been dealing with the abuse for 30 years, I can be in a room full of people and I still feel that isolation. I still feel alienated and different from everybody. So that is still an issue in my life. Um, as far as family, um, I cut my wrist at 15 and when I got home, I told my mom, and um, she's like, well, I knew something happened to you. I thought it was your dad. And I couldn't get that on, out of my mind. She knew something had happened to me. And she did nothing to protect me. Or I just felt so betrayed. And the first time I was put in treatment, they put me in a room with my mom and my uncle that molested me. And I took all my anger out on my mother because I had lived with that betrayal for over 10 years that she knew and you know and did nothing and um i still deal with some of that <sighs> today but um yeah forgiveness is what we do for ourselves first and foremost but it is always it's a process it, it yes. is something that is always an ongoing process and there's always triggers that can yes. happen and we being aware that there's triggers in Finding coping mechanisms or ways ways to watch for those triggers yes. um, is very important to note. And then finding something that works for you to get past it. You know, notice the trigger and do something to to. Oh, I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm not going there this time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Setting boundaries and stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Christina. Um, I would say my greatest obstacle is actually fear of unknown, um, fear, um, uh, I, I like to control situations, and if I feel like I'm not in control of it, then I escape or I don't do it. Um, for instance, like the interviews that you wanted to do for the book, I canceled two of those just because I didn't feel like I was going to be totally in control of myself, and so I worked myself up that I was making myself sick. And um, you invited me for a dinner one time, and I canceled because the whole night long I was sick. Um, just fear of what, how people are going to perceive me, um, and how they're going to look at me and things and so it, it's an ongoing thing that I'm working with but I think that was that's my greatest obstacle is just you know taking down masks and things that I've put up for other people to see and you know people um, like that when I was working they saw me as one person but it was really just a mask of me and it was the person I allowed them to it's not really the true person and um, I just I've worked on trying to take down the mask and um, showing the true person so well uh, I, I have watched you grow since since we for, first met this second time around here and I'm really <laughs> really proud of you for the growth that you've made and the steps you've made the strides thank you <clears throat> Karen Hello. Um, I would say my greatest obstacle was myself, mm -hmm. and I have just the, I had the fear of failure, and just constantly at my back, and with um, anxiety being thrown into that, um, I 
I hit a roadblock and when, when I realized that was in counseling when I had to write five things I loved about myself and I could only get two. <laughs> and that was when I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, how did I get here? And then um, that's kind of when the floodgates went open and everything kind of came out. And, um, and uh, by the end of it, I could feel two pages of things that I did love about myself by the end of counseling. And she said just to keep adding as I went along. And, um, but yeah, myself, I, I was my greatest obstacle, the doubt, the shame, the anger. Um, so um, once I got past it or continued to go past it, it's like you don't know how bad you were until you're okay until you finally became, became better. You don't realize how bad it was. And so, yeah, that was yeah, myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. I get that. And I have a graphic that I've used a number of times in my marketing in that one lens, it's a girl wearing sunglasses that are painted, the lenses are painted white. But this one says the shame that they don't see and the shame that they don't know. And, and that it, it just fits so perfectly for for what we really face because shame is such a big thing and the feelings of guilt and oh I could have done something about it I you know all the things even if it started when you were a tiny child you still feel such shame you know and it, it's really amazing okay Sandra uh, okay so I think my biggest obstacle was a, one of them was a lot of fear which I hadn't really ever experienced before. And I would know that a fax was coming, a simple piece of paper was coming through a fax machine, and I would just lose it. My heart rate would go up, and um, I'd start shaking, and I would get irrational in my thinking just because this person was sending me a piece of paper. And so, you know, I realized that, that this fear was so visceral, it was so in my body, and it was so not like anything I'd ever experienced before. So that was a really big obstacle for me. And then I think the second one was just that I was so in denial and disbelief that, mm. that there's people in the world that could treat other people that way. I mean, I just, it, you know, I was kind of innocent or whatever, and I just was like, really? really this is really happening and that kind of sense of just not even being able to believe that that was true kind of was a big obstacle i had to finally really realize yes this really is happening and i really have the power to do something about it but when i'm in that state of just disbelief it was hard to really realize that somebody could treat another human being how, that way how could this possibly be yeah Wow. How could that happen? Yeah, we wonder, don't we? You know, and we we just, it's hard to put it together. So now let's kind of shift this a little bit, because now we've talked about, you know, the, the, the obstacles and the pain that we've experienced. But what's been your greatest aha about the, and the, what, or the greatest reward that's happened by sticking with your healing process? I'll start with you, Sandra. Well, my, let's see, there's lots, but I think one for me is, I think I was boundarily, bound, I had no boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so I think a really big thing, a big aha for me was to get really comfortable that boundaries are okay mm -hmm. and that that makes me safe and other people safe. So I think that was a big aha for me. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing was just, you know, realizing that even though I was going through all this stuff, I believe there are so many amazing people on this planet. You know, just knowing that love to me is stronger and can be stronger. And I look for the sparks in life, the people that I really connect with and, and I let that spiral of energy happen. And so if I feel like the disbelief on one hand, but then I can go, wow, I just met another amazing woman or I just heard another amazing story or there's some really juicy energy between me and this person and we're going to create something <laughs> fantastic on the planet 
it's like, yeah, now I'm more, I think I'm more aware of the juiciness because I've had the other experience than maybe I was before. And so I really honor when I'm, uh, I have the privilege to be with people where we're, I guess we're sparking, sparking yeah, together for the, sparking. Good of, yeah. for the good of all. For sure. Thank you. Heather? That I can change what happens from here on in and not in a control sense but in a sense of working on myself to step into the truth of who I am. Um, I was attracting still partners uh, because of my low self-worth. I was attracting partners into my life or people but mostly uh, partners uh, who I couldn't trust to be intimate with. So I would always be the one to blame because things weren't rolling out how they should in the bedroom in as far as their expectations. And in order for me to be who I am, I could stop that kind of um, experiences coming into my life by discovering my self-worth and knowing that, no, I, I don't have to have these people keep treating me the same way. So... Um, since I've done that, it's just been uh, opening up into experiences like this and others where it's very um, rewarding and empowering. Yes, we seem to attract sometimes, especially if we've had big from childhood, that's what we know and we attract that. And it yes. takes a while to break that pattern. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Kaylin. Um, I'm going to definitely ring true with what Sandra said is the boundaries. And, and as I have started my women's coaching, um, I've had experiences recently that have reminded me that boundaries are a real thing and that I have to, I have to live within those because I've got women that are coming in that I'm serving that, that need to understand that they need to have boundaries too. And so implementing those in my life, and to be honest with you, I was doing it unconsciously, but, but as of just the past little while, I've been very focused on it. And I love how the heavens and the universe just bring experiences in to help us be able to really get life and to learn what we need to learn to be our very best and to show up our very best as that's the desire that we have. And so instituting those boundaries, I, I don't know why I was like, whoa, that's just like a new revelation. <laughs> and it was like, right. And who even knew it? I've been doing it, like I said, subconsciously, but you really have to go down and say, okay, what are my zero tolerances? What is it that I absolutely refuse to have come into my life? And, and being able to put those into, to articulate them, to write them down, to remember them as I go throughout, because as you and I know, we're, we are creating something that's a, a global movement. Mm -hmm. and, and we're putting ourselves out in the world in a very, very, very big way. And we know that there are going to be people that are going to come into our lives and who have, and who, who will continue that, you have to be careful if you have to put that boundary in place and say, mm, mm. it's not a good fit. Exactly. But, you know, and then like Sandra said, because I'm just ringing true to what you said here, Sandra, it's like those kindred spirits like you and I. So I <laughs> the same. First time I met Becky, we were going to, uh, and <laughs> she was the first person that I saw when I walked into um, this waiting area. We're getting ready to go into the event just like this, instant clicking, felt this, this kindred spirit, and here we are now. And it has just been the most beautiful thing. Totally amazing. Yeah. Totally amazing, right? <laughs> yeah. We just can't seem to get enough. We're just so excited. We have no idea where we're going, but it's pretty awesome where we're going. You know, so the ahas for me are really paying attention to what the universe's messages are, what it is that I need to learn, to continue to become and show up my very best in this world. And boundaries are part of that mm -hmm. because it's the safety net. It's the safety it is. issue. And we have to feel that wherever we go, anywhere we go, that we're safe. And saying that I am safe, I am protected. And feeling that because then we're going to show up as safe. Which and I think confident. Yes. And, very, and very confident, absolutely. 
And some people may, may think that, you know, that confidence may think that we, we you know, might be not a, ba a, a boundary for us, but, but it actually is because we know this is what we will accept, this is what we won't accept. And, and some people, when it comes to confidence, they're like, oh, they think they can do anything and be with anyone. No, we get to choose. We define them ourselves. We, them. Yeah. we get to choose. Very good. Thank you. You bet. Renee. Uh, for me, I think the aha was actually an aha moment. I <laughs> was at a point where I was terrified to go across the street and buy milk because what if I got the wrong kind? What if I forgot? I was My husband at the time wouldn't have cared. He really wouldn't have. He was the most laid back person on earth. It was my problem, but it was something I didn't know how to handle. And he talked me into doing a volunteer trip overseas. I made the biggest fool of myself, which was my fear. That was, what if I did, said, thought, felt something wrong? I fell face first into a sheep pasture off of a truck doing volunteer work. <laughs> and I just, I just wanted to lay there and sink into the ground. And when everybody came over and the first thing they said is, are you okay? Can we help you? What can we do for you? I went, wait a second. You guys don't hate me? That was like the dumbest thing ever. And it, I swear, in a movie, the light bulb would have gone on over my head. <laughs> wait a minute. I'm okay. And it, it was literally that moment, and that moment will last in my life forever that, okay, you know what? It's okay to, you know, mess up. Stand up, shake it off. In my case, dust off. I'm going to stay mud. I don't care <laughs> and move on, move forward. It's okay. And that was the first time that I was able to stand up, laugh at myself and not run and hide. So it was literally an aha moment for me. That was a magnificent aha moment. <laughs> Thank a you. A little dirty one, but it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> Terry. My biggest aha moment would have had to have been when I realized it wasn't my fault. And then having kids and seeing their innocence. I started being molested when I was three years old. And having kids and seeing their innocence, you, you realize it could never be a child's fault. Um, another aha moment for me was when I was in treatment for the first time. And they put a name to my craziness. I had PTSD, anxiety, depression. And then there, there was treatment for this. And I got such hope out of that. And then another aha moment for me was realizing I had to enter a 12-step program because I was turning to alcohol and drugs to numb my pain. And um, it's turned into such a wonderful journey of self-love and self-care. And then being able to tell my story and, you know, to help others. And I just thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, we're this. so happy you joined us. Thank you. Thank you. Christina. Um, I would say my biggest aha moment, or one of them, is um, soon after my father, who was my abuser, passed away, and um, I was at about 500 pounds, and um, my my body was basically dying, and I was in and out of the hospital once a week, had high blood pressure, um, heart problems. Um, you name it, I had it. And a doctor came to me and said, you know, you're probably not going to live much longer. You know, it's, it's um, either you start taking control of your life or it's going to be done, you know. And so I chose um, to have gastric bypass. But um, with that, they made me do counseling. And it was one of the things that I think actually saved me because going to counseling, I found that um, talking about my abuse and talking about other issues that I was having along with it, like sexual problems with my husband, different things, um, I, as I was talking about it and taking down masks and um, releasing some of that anger and hurt and fears and everything, um, not only was um, my mental ability yeah. um, 
going ahead and lowering, you know, that everything was coming off, um, that way the weight was starting to come down as well without the gastric bypass yet. And then I had the gastric bypass continued working through the issues in counseling. And I've lost over 200 pounds because of that. So um, I'm, I'm better because of that, you know, um, not just feeling mentally better, but physically as well. I'm able to walk now before I wasn't able to really walk across the room without losing my breath. Um, so it's life changing, um, but it wasn't, it was me taking control of my life and um, that was one of the areas that I needed to take control of. And another one, it just happened a couple of days ago and um, I probably will start crying about it, but um, my mom and me have had some difficulties um, through what has happened. Um, she was not my abuser, but I still felt that she did not protect me. Um, and I think that she mentally was not able to handle some of the situations. Um, I was told to keep a lot of the things secret. So when I came out um, to her about this book that I was going to be in it, she really wasn't thrilled about me coming public about what was happening because my dad was a very well-known man and um, very highly respected. And so she really didn't want me to come out. I, I just told her a few days ago, um, she's also a friend of my Facebook, so I've been sharing that the book is out and um, she commented on it and she said, um, I'm very proud of you. And that meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And it was an aha moment to me, you know, I have shared with you, Becky, a few of the things about my mom and stuff, but it kind of is a aha moment to me because it's a starting point it is. It for is. us again. So, and I think deep down, those that are um, the ones we thought should have been our protectors, they don't want us to tell the story. But at the same time, when we stand up and have the courage to do so, I think deep down they they're so proud because they know that you are growing and have the courage to speak up and that you're making the changes necessary. And I think a lot of times they wish they had that ability too. You know. Oh yeah, I think so yeah. too. Thank you. Karen. Um, I would say I had two recent aha moments. One was actually the day after Christmas. I was at the store with my daughter and my husband. My husband had ran off to use the restroom real quick, and I was standing there, and I saw um, the perpetrator, the, the man who had attacked me. And I just kind of stood there and froze. And this had happened before a few years ago. I had seen him at the same store, and I ran away that time. And this time I just stood there. I had my daughter with me, and I'm just like, am I okay? I'm okay. I was like, okay. I'm, I, 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 I don't even want to go up to him and confront him or anything. I'm just like, because I know he feels he has done nothing wrong. He honestly probably doesn't even remember it. Um, that, uh, but I just, I just like, I'm okay. Like, this is, Yay. this is where I knew that I've, I've came to a point in my life and that. We're celebrating with you. Yes, it's so special. And I, I didn't, um, I, I got home and I just kind of sat there and I cried and my husband thought I was upset, of course, and he's like, it's okay, it's okay. And of course, he's like, I should have said something to him. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, I'm like, I'm okay, I'm happy. These are happy tears. I'm just like, it's, I mean, from being 15 years old and here I am, 28, I'm like, I'm, I'm okay. And um, <laughs> the other one was... Um, I had hit a roadblock in some of my work at school, and I was feeling very upset um, and depressed that day. And I had um, was getting up to leave the class because we were talking actually about sexual violence. Um, it was a uh, women's studies course. And I got up to leave as I was just like, I can't take this today. And I got up, and my professor grabbed me and hugged me and just, and just hugged me. And she's like, it's, you know, it's okay. Because they all knew what I do and what I've been through and um, it was a very close group in that class and um, 
during that class, I had one of my friends said, do you remember when you did the panel your first year at Auburn, your first panel? I said, yes, yeah. because you remember the girl that came up to you and told you about her story? I said, yes. I, and she said, that was me. And um, wow. she said, I'm coming out to my family about all of this during Thanksgiving. And you started this. I um, got go goosebumps. <laughs> I know. I'm just thinking about it. And then another girl, she was in a, a previous class with me in another women's group. When, when I first um, went on TV and talked about it during Sexual Assault Awareness Month, um, she said, you remember we were in class and you, and you went on TV and the teacher shared the link and everything. She said, it made me realize what happened to me wasn't okay and that it was okay to talk about. I'm just in there like bawling in front of my entire class, just like, you know, it's, you, you do your best and you, you volunteer, you do, you do whatever you do, everything you can to bring awareness and push stuff and change things. And you just hope it reverberates. You hope it just spreads. And I felt like that's what it was. It was like a drop and it just, just, just the ripple effect. effect. Yeah. It was wonderful. Karen, that's beautiful. So if you had a chance to do it all over again, what would you do differently? Honestly, I'm usually the type of person that says I have no regrets, even the bad things that have happened. Um, I, I wonder um, when I was 15 years old if I would have started talking about it because I also I had a lot of self-worth issues even before this. Would I have been able to handle it then? I don't know if I would have been. Um, I, I had bouts of depression. Um, so I truly, I don't know if I would change anything. Um, I'd maybe get help sooner, maybe go into counseling sooner um, than I did. But um, I don't know if I would have uh, been in the right state of mind to have gotten, uh, to have came and talked about it then. But, um, but yeah, so. Very cool. Thank you. Sandra. Would you, um, if you had to do over again, what would you do differently? I would have listened to my intuition and really befriended my intuition. Um, it's like if I had two little voices on my shoulder and, you know, one was my intuition saying, no, this isn't okay, this isn't, no, 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 whatever, and the other one going, well, but, you know, seems so, you know, seems okay, it's, you know, it's, you know, whatever. I had those two voices, and I think I would have given this intuition voice just a ton of credence, really mm -hmm. deeply listened, <clears throat> and that that would have led to very different actions uh, for me. And so, um, and then the second thing would have been to reach out sooner to girlfriends. I have, and they've been awesome, but I think in the beginning I didn't as much as I could have. And I think reaching out to the women in my world right off the bat and, um, you know, am I crazy or what? You know, just getting that affirmation from women friends would have been awesome. Very cool. I know for myself when I published my book last August, The Woman I Love, um, a lot of my very closest friends said, we didn't know that. We didn't know this about you because I kept it so quiet, mm -hmm. you know. So, and I didn't have to, they could have, they would have been happy to help me through that, you know? Right, and I just want to clarify, I have a couple of very, very close friends who were with me through this whole thing, but I think that um, somebody else brought that up about the isolation, and I think just being, just being willing to share more with more women through women's groups or through talking about things and the intuition, that those two things would have helped my healing in a much different mm -hmm. way. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Heather? Yeah. My belief is as similar to Karen's is that I don't think that uh, what has unfolded has been meant to unfold uh, in its own process. I think if I, because of the, the low self-esteem, et cetera, if I had jumped into something right away, whether that be, um, I don't know, being in a group of women or whatever, um, I don't think I would have been able to handle it. I think it would have been bringing more shame upon me. Um, so I, I, the only thing that I would suggest is because I tend to isolate myself, um, I would want to, because I did the counseling one-on-one, -on -one, I talked to friends, but it would be one-on-one, -on -one. it wouldn't be within a group. I really encourage people now 
uh, to be in a women's group and uh, somewhere that you can touch, like not through um, cyberspace, although those things are, are great, like the pages on uh, the groups that are on Facebook, you really need to be in front of a group of women to, to share and be comforted and, and uh, to be nurtured. And, and uh, that's, that's, again, there's been, no, there's been nothing that I would want to change. I would just make a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Terry? Um, I agree with the ladies. I think about the only thing that I wish I could change was that I didn't get help sooner. Mm -hmm. I'm dealing with the PTSD and the depression and the anxiety untreated was horrible, you know, for years with it going untreated. So I really do wish that I would have gotten help sooner. When I, my first flashback, I was 26 years old. I had three small children at home and I was going in and out of treatment, you know, with these three kids and them coming to visit me in treatment, mm -hmm. you know, a six, a six week program, a three month program. And I felt really bad about that. So I wished I could have gotten help sooner. That's Thank all. you. Christina? Um, I have a really strong um, faith in God. And um, there is um, a scripture in the Bible where it says that there is a time for planting, a time for sowing, a time for to be born, a time to die. And I think um, this is my time to heal. And this is my time to say um, what happened to me. Um, I could have, I could have done it five years ago when we met, but obviously it wasn't my time, and it wasn't your time as well, Becky. It wasn't um, then, right? Yeah. So I don't think if even anybody approached me five years ago, I would have been ready at that time. Um, so I wouldn't change anything. I think now is my time. Thank you. Very good. Renee? I, I think like Heather and Karen and everybody is saying, I was 13 when it started. I was 16 when the relationship more or less ended. I wasn't ready. I wouldn't have been able to handle anything when it came to trying to heal at the time. I kind of wish I would have told my mom, but it would have really forced everything right into the forefront. And I don't think I could have handled that. I didn't turn to friends because I've always been a tomboy. All my friends were guys, and it's really hard to tell a group of guys, hey, <laughs> this guy just did this. And I don't even yeah. think I realized what he did until later on. It wasn't mm -hmm. until I had that aha moment we talked about earlier that I realized, wow, I'm really messed up. <laughs> I've got some stuff I gotta work on. I knew I was afraid to go get milk, but I didn't know why. Mm -hmm. And I was diagnosed with PTSD as well, just like Terry. And again, I didn't even know why it, cause I didn't tell my therapist what happened. Cause I still, I wasn't in a place where I could even fully understand it, I think. And right. now that I'm in a place where I can kind of look back objectively, I am feeling more confident myself and feeling stronger in what I do just in everyday life. I think this is like everybody's been saying, it's not so much that I could have or couldn't have done anything differently. I just don't think it was the time to do it. Right. Very cool. Thank you. Kaylin. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just ditto what everybody else has said. You know, m mine took place between the ages of five and eight. And you don't even know what's happening at that age. It's, it just doesn't click. Right. And, and you know that, that it wasn't right but you don't know what to do. And so, you know, I went through life just thinking that this was what happened. I wouldn't change anything now because I see how everything has had a purpose and, and, and where I'm at now is I, I'm in the best place of my life. And, and I look back and, and what I've discovered is that, and you and I have talked about this, our story is what has made us mm -hmm. who we are. And it's the resilience. It's being able to say, I've overcome. I can go through this. And, and I see for me now that the pain, the abuse, the, the trials, the adversity, the, the anxiety, the depression, the weight gain, the weight loss, the weight gain, the weight loss, the weight, you know, because that just keeps going on, right? They have all been my greatest gifts because they have, are what helped make me 
who I am now. And I've made a, a very conscious choice to look at them in that light, that they are my gifts, that they are making me stronger and being able to, I've, I've now, I'm able to go out and help other women. And that's my purpose. Because of what happened, I am now able to go out and say, I'm here to serve. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got a calling. This calling is to help women, let them know that regardless of what's happened in their lives, we are so amazing and powerful and resilient. <laughs> it's the human soul. And we can go and bounce back and prove to everyone, but prove to ourselves, we got this. We got it. We got it. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. So the words of wisdom that you would share, Kaylin, with those that are just starting their journey, that are maybe even listening to this today and knowing that inner voice is talking to them and saying it's time to do something, mm -hmm. what would you say to them? Do it. Do it. Take that inspired action. Take that inspired action. One more time. Take that inspired action. Because that, as a woman, we talk about it all the time, we have this gift of intuition, this beautiful inner voice. And when we listen to it, it's going to guide us divinely where we need to go. Because what happens is, we hear that intuition, we hear this red flag, we see, you know, feel these red flags flopping up, it's a sign, we don't go there, that's part of the boundary that we've got in place. So, but when you hear it, Go and do what that voice is telling you because that's your strongest, highest divine self coming through to protect you. Mm. And that's what we want is to be protected and safe. Very good. Thank you. Terry. Um, I just want to say that there is help and there is hope. Um, it can be really hard, but it is so worth it. Um, it is utilize the services available shelters mental health services 12-step programs you know reach out to your, your community and your um the services in your community you know the sooner you get help the sooner you will start to heal and i have an amazing beautiful life today that i never thought i'd have that's so beautiful my recovery and right. thank you thank there you. i think for most of us we never realized how much help there was out there you know, we just didn't know, and and that's one of the messages that that um, somebody was on one of our interviews yesterday, and a listener asked in the chat box, "Oh, why didn't you go to the police? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that?" And it was it was really the responses from all of us were that we didn't know that we could, or maybe there was a lot of fear surrounding it, and so we couldn't do that, but. But that is so true. So there is amazing resources out there now. Very good. Uh, Brittany, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think for me, my hardest thing about trying to move and start the process was afraid of failing. Don't be afraid to fail. It's going to be hard. It's going to have setbacks. There's going to be days where you're like, why am I bothering? Hmm. Don't give up. Thank it's you. worth it and don't be afraid to fail and try again perfect thank you sandra well i i feel very humbled by what everybody's been sharing and i just wanted to say that i was not abused as a child um my story is a little bit different it happened as an older adult and so there's some different kind of circumstances and it was mostly psychological but yes, some physical. But I guess um, what I would say is that, well, two things. In every moment, we have a choice. And so if someone's just beginning their healing journey, my, um, my love for them would be to choose to honor themselves every time they're going to take a step. Choose to honor yourself, not what you know a voice tells you you should be doing or your family or whatever is just to take a moment, take a breath and take a moment and really choose to honor yourself. And the other thing I would say for women that are older, that are looking for partner, not older, but you know, not children, looking for partners, is I would say, if it feels too good to be true. <laughs> it typically is. Guess what? <laughs> yeah, it is too good to be true. 
you know, we're all human and we're all have our frailties. And I think as women, we, you know, we sometimes have a fairy tale idea of what that perfect partner is going to look like. And we put it out there and then somebody comes in and they seem to fit that. And it's like, Oh my God, yay, it's happened. <laughs> but you know, it's uh, it's really wise to, uh, those are probably the biggest, the biggest red flags for us as women in terms of relationships, step back and um, really listen to that intuition, honor yourself and realize that, you know, it might be a little bit too good to be true. <laughs> you know, everybody's human. Right. Well, one of the things that I wanted to say um, to your comment about abuse and when it happened is that abuse is abuse. Mm -hmm. No matter when it happened, no matter what kind of abuse it is, that there's no measuring measuring device to to measure how your abuse is going to affect you later in life compared to somebody as a child. There's no we're not making comparisons here. Abuse is abuse, no matter what kind of the abuse, and we honor that. And that's what this is for: is that we understand that abuse can come in many different forms, but love yourself through it. Do the measures when, as you step into that, realize that that is the case and that we've all, our abuse, none of us is exactly the same as the other. We, it's the full range of abuse, different kinds of abuse. So thank you for sharing, Sandra. Yeah. Miss Karen. Um, I would say it's okay to stand up. It's okay to push forward even if people aren't following behind you because you're never really alone in this. It's okay to not be okay. Um, we all um, choose different paths. You just need to make it on your terms. Choose how you want to cope and heal on your terms and do not let someone dictate you on how you feel. And I mean, you push back. You, you be strong and brave, and it's okay. It's okay to be a little selfish, and it's okay to self-care. It's, it's okay, and um, there's no right way, and I think uh, a lot of people um, think there is one right way to heal when there's really not. Um, we, kind of, we all had different processes, and um, so... I mean, for me, I mean, it was standing up, fighting back, changing laws, doing this, and where someone else, it's different, and that's okay. That's right. and, and and so, um, no comparing. Yes. So don't compare yourself. Just you do what you feel is right and what works for you, and um, and yeah, you're never alone in this. There's always there's always support. Thank you, Karen. And Christina. Um, my biggest suggestion would be is to not stuff. Don't stuff your feelings. To get them out somehow. My favorite one is actually singing. And I have one uh, that I really actually love. And I asked Becky if I could actually share a little segment of it. Um, so I hope it not that bad but it goes life is what you make it just embrace it even though your heart aches sweetest days are yet to come it takes patience to heal a situation when i reach out god will always be around it comes down to me it's my responsibility to lean on him for strength. He heals me every time. He gives me peace of mind. But that, I, I love to sing that one. Um, and as you can hear, I'm sure, my dog. <laughs> I don't know if they hate my singing or they love my singing. Um, one or the other, but... Um, through your, your company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's my favorite thing to actually sing. And okay, you're heading out on it. I'm very good speaker, so. 
Very good. Well, your dog. I'm not very good at speaking. I love it. (laughs) You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So, on behalf of We Choose to Thrive and the woman I love, we thank each one of you for being here today. We hope that you, as a listener, if this touches your heart, reach out to any one of us. Reach out. Know that you're supported. Know you're not alone. And just honor yourself and love yourself. Thank you, ladies, for being here today.